Okay, welcome to the 70th episode of the Henry George Daily Devotional. Yes, you're right, this is not Friday, and this is, uh, should be, this is Monday. Uh, that's because the power went out in my house on Friday, and then I didn't make it up over Saturday or Sunday. Here we go, though. We are in Book 7, Chapter 2, halfway through it. Uh, Chapter 2 is the enslavement of laborers, the ultimate result of private property in land. Yes, private property in land. George writes, "When When the idea of individual ownership, which so justly and naturally attaches to things of human production, is extended to land, all the rest is a mere matter of development. The strongest and most cunning easily acquire a superior share in this species of property, which is to be had not by production, but by appropriation. And in becoming lords of the land, they become necessarily lords of their fellow men. Yes, if you have all the money in the world, and I own all the land in the world, what would I charge for your first night of rent? Hmm? The ownership of land is the basis of aristocracy. It was not nobility that gave land, but the possession of land that gave nobility. All the And then also this other comment. The strongest and most cunning easily acquire a superior share in the species of property of land. That's how it started. And you might argue that that's no longer the case. But even if it is the case, even if it is some and some... You know, the superior economic actors, I mean, maybe that means strongest. I mean, we don't live in such a violent place, at least I don't, where the best warriors are the ones that get the most land. Um, But whatever the hierarchy is, suppose suppose that is just granted by genetics, uh, who gets to be the top of whatever hierarchy you're part of. Like, so what? You still need a system where each person gets the just rewards of their labor. Like, it does not justify the simple fact that we don't have an equal distribution of competence and skill does not justify an aristocracy. Like, even if there were magic, like in Lord of the Rings, right? In that world, the, there were certain families and lines and even races that in some sense were just superior to other families or bloodlines or races. Uh, uh-oh, is my f- headset low on battery? I think my headset may be low on battery. Um, anyway, whoa. my point I think I'm still going here. My point is, even if the elves are superior to men, like the elves don't enslave the men, the elves don't need to, you need to have a form of governance where men still get the just reward of their labor, even if elves kick their butt and everything. All right, I think I'm charging. I'm charging as I speak. All right, we haven't gone far. It was not nobility that gave land, but the possession of land that gave nobility, George writes. All the enormous privileges of the nobility of medieval Europe flowed from their position at the owners as the owners of the soil. The simple principle of the ownership of the soil produced on the one side the lord and on the other the vassal. The one having all rights, the other none. The right of the Lord to the soil acknowledged and maintained. Those who lived upon it could do so only upon his terms. The manners and conditions of the times made those terms include services and servitudes, as well as rents in produce or money. But the essential thing that compelled them was the ownership of land. Yes, the ownership of land is what caused lords and vassals. This power exists wherever the ownership of land exists and can be brought out wherever the competition for the use of land is great enough to enable the landlord to make his own terms. The English landowner of today 
1879, has in the law, which recognizes his exclusive right to the land, essentially all the power which his predecessor, the feudal baron, had. He might command rent in services or services, servitudes. He might compel his tenants to dress themselves in a particular way, to profess a particular religion, to send their children to a particular school, to submit their differences to his decision, to fall upon their knees when he spoke to them, to follow him around in his livery, or to sacrifice to him female honor, if they would prefer these things to being driven off his land. Now, I don't know, there is a cultural shift in our time. I mean, like, we, the, 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 the landed gentry only continued to exist at, at the, you know, behest of the masses, not, you know, we don't, we're not rising up against them. I, I believe that if landlords, if any landlord that I've had, had demanded that I have sex with them, uh, I'm pretty sure... Uh, society would have sort of risen up against them. So there is some sense that over the course of time, the lower class, at least in some, although let's let's admit in some parts of the world that definitely, you know, you'd have to have sex with them. Uh, but we can say the lower class in the USA, at least, and most modern countries have at least partially revolted against some form of these tyrannies as a form of like corporate bargaining or what's uh, collective bargaining almost but they haven't got at the core issue um the landlord, he, could demand in short any terms on which men would still consent to live on his land and the law could not prevent him so long as it did not qualify his ownership for compliance with them would assume the form of a free contract or voluntary act. And English landlords do exercise such of these powers as in the manners of the times they care to. Having shaken off the obligation of providing for the defense of the country, they no longer need the military service of their tenants, and the possession of wealth and power being now shown in other ways than by long trains of attendance, they no longer care for personal service. Yeah, there is some sort of a PR game that the upper classes have to go through, which is uh, making it seem less uh, less in your face how how much more wealthy they are. I guess um, that's that thing with like uh, billionaires now dress, you know, in t-shirts and jeans. Um, anyway. Uh, but maybe that's just a sign that they're having to hide their exploitation. Um, and again, we, when I say billionaire, I don't mean, I mean, I do include Elon Musk and, uh, uh, Zuckerberg and Bezos, but the majority of billionaires are, are not tech entrepreneurs. They are. Uh, hedge fund managers or natural resource monopolists over land or oil or whatever. And remember, oil and natural resources is land-like in the Georgian sense. Okay, but the landlords, they habitually control the votes of their tenants and are dictate to them in many little ways. That right reverend father in god bishop lord plunkett evicted a number of his poor irish tenants because they would not send their children to protestant sunday schools and to that earl of latrim for whom nemesis tarried so long before she sped the bullet of an assassin even darker crimes are imputed um yeah we now have a kind of revert like now we have public schools that, in a sense, most families almost are forced to send their kids to. Uh, of course, we say they're not forced. They could go to private school or they can homeschool, but that's expensive. And we basically force all of our kids to go to public school, which many in the religious world would argue is itself a form of religion. Uh, and I, it's hard for me to say that the raising of a child in that way 
is not some kind of um, huge uh, relinquishment of control and influence over a child, you know, whether it's particularly religion or not, it's, it's, yeah, like the fact yeah, and, and if we were to give money back to all these families so that they could educate their kids however they pleased, uh, the renter class would just see that all that money sucked up by higher rents. So I used to think, you know, the biggest issue of our society was public education, and we needed to basically free people to educate their kids however they wanted. Now I just don't see that as a possibility because as soon as you give money back, to all the people, you know, 40% of Americans rent, and the, that money would just be gone, and then their kids wouldn't have uh, any form of um, education pretty much at all. Anyway. George writes, while at the cold promptings of greed, cottage after cottage has been pulled down and family after family forced into the roads. The principle that permits this is the same principle that in ruder times and a simpler social state enthralled the great masses of the common people and placed such a wide gulf between noble and peasant. Where the peasant was made a serf, it was simply by forbidding him to leave the estate on which he was born, thus artificially producing the condition we supposed on the island. The island is, was our example of like 99, an island owned by one and 99 people having to do whatever that one wanted. In sparsely settled countries, this is necessary to produce absolute slavery. But where land is fully occupied, competition may produce substantially the same conditions. Between the condition of the rack-rented Irish peasant and the Russian serf, the advantage was in many things on the side of the serf. The serf did not starve. Now, as I think I've conclu conclusively proved, it is the same cause which has in every age degraded and enslaved the laboring masses that is working in the civilized world today. Yeah, this kind of like... The, the sort of vile argument that slaves were treated better during slavery in, a, in the U.S. than how they got on once they were freed. That argument only holds weight because when they were freed, it wasn't into a free society. It was into a land slave society. It was into a, it was, they were freed into a society where the land was already owned by everybody still. So in, a, in many ways, you know, the North, or the South, are, sometimes it, like you get these pedantic arguments that they say, oh, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free a single slave because the South claims to have been a different nation at that time and the North had no jurisdiction there. Well, I don't care about that. those little, that, m m disputing that little technicality in law, but I do care about the fact that for all the non-landowning people in the South or in the North, or on the earth, it's pretty, pretty tough um, to get your fair wages. Personal liberty, that is to say, the liberty to move about is everywhere conceded. Um, now I think I've conclusively pr pr proved it is the same cause which has in every age degraded and enslaved the laboring masses that is working in the civilized world today. Personal liberty, that is to say the liberty to move about, is everywhere conceded. While of political and legal inequality there are in the United States no vestiges. It's funny he uses this term when women still couldn't vote. Um, although he was pretty supportive of women voting in other writings. And in the most backward civilized countries but few. Um, but he's saying men everywhere could move about and they could all vote. 
but the great cause of inequality remains and is manifesting itself in the unequal distribution of wealth the essence of slavery is that it takes from the laborer all he produces save enough to support an animal existence and to this minimum the wages of free labor under existing conditions unmistakably tend whatever be the increase of productive power rent steadily tends to swallow up the gain and more than the gain I'm going to end this episode here.